Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics of Richard Kuklinski, otherwise known as the Iceman. Kuklinski was convicted of four murders in 1988 and a fifth murder in 2003. He was made popular in part due to the HBO specials that were made about him, including one where he was diagnosed by a clinician named Dr. Deese. This was somebody who was interviewing him as part of this special. Now, Richard Kuklinski was a real person, so just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody here in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a case like this. So first I'll look at the timeline and then take a look at the mental health and personality characteristics we see in this case. Kuklinski was born in 1935 in Jersey City, New Jersey, in the United States. He was mistreated horribly in his childhood by both his father and his mother, including being physically beaten regularly, and at one point his mother attempted to kill him. Kuklinski had an older brother, a younger sister, and a younger brother. His father allegedly killed his older brother by beating him to death. Kuklinski said that the family claimed that his older brother fell down the steps, now, the older brother did in fact die, but we really don't know if he was murdered or not. There's no corroboration for that part of the story. His younger brother committed murder in 1970 and was still in prison in 2003 when he died. And this, of course, comes from more reliable sources than just Richard Kukinski. We see that Kukinski said that he committed his first murder when he was around 13 or 14 years of age, killing a neighborhood bully. There's no evidence that this murder ever happened. No one was missing from that neighborhood at that time. Over time, the story also changed quite a bit from his original story. As a child, Kukinski killed both cats and dogs in his neighborhood, and this is often considered a key sign of psychopathy. We see he was married and had two sons. Later, he was married again and had a son and a daughter. Kukinski's second wife described him as having a good mood sometimes, and a bad mood other times. So there was times when he was a generous and loving father and husband, and times when he would be violent. Now, other than the murder he allegedly committed when he was younger, it seems that he started out with smaller crimes and then moved up. This is also very common with psychopathy. He worked in a film lab that gave him access to master copies of movies. He used those to make illegal copies, and he sold them. He was involved in a number of burglaries and car thefts. Before he was arrested for the series of murders he committed later on, we see that he was only arrested once for passing a bad check, and those charges were dropped when he paid back the money that he had stolen. Because Kukinski tended to lie a lot, it's actually pretty hard to know what murders he actually committed. So I'll go through a few that seem to be pretty clear. These are murders that it is believed that he committed, and there's several different sources that would support this. So looking at February of 1980, we see Kukinski shoots and kills a criminal associate after they had an argument. But his motive for that killing is not really known, right? He indicated that it was because of an argument. But again, we don't see any other sources indicating what motive might have been there. The murder, though, clearly did happen. July 1981, Kukinski kills a criminal associate and he takes his money. He puts the body in a freezer for over two years and eventually dumped it near a park. The body was found in September of 1983. This is where he got the name the Iceman because he used the freezer. The motive for this murder was theft. In April of 1982, he killed another criminal associate, so we see kind of a pattern emerging here, using a gun and a tire iron. His motive for this murder appears to have been money that he stole from the victim. Now we see in this murder, when Kukinski was using this gun, he did not kill the victim with the first shot, and then the gun jammed after this. So even at point-blank range, he couldn't murder this person with one bullet. He had to then use a tire iron to kill him. So we can see that Kukinski doesn't seem to be really good at planning out these crimes. In December 1982, he once again kills a criminal associate, this time using cyanide and strangulation. The motive here appears to be that he was afraid that this criminal would have testified against him. So again, we see the use of multiple methods. The cyanide probably would have worked, but he got impatient, 
so he ended up strangling the victim. Again, evidence of impulsivity and just not really careful planning. Now, sometime between February and May of 1983, again, he uses cyanide and strangulation to kill another criminal associate. That victim's body was found in May of 1983. The motive in this particular murder was not clear. Then going to August of 1984, we see that he kills yet another criminal associate by shooting him twice in the chest, ostensibly as a result of an argument between the two men. So now moving to December 17th, 1996, over two years since that last murder, we see that he's arrested for five murders and many other lesser charges. He was convicted for two of the murders, largely based on his own confession to an undercover officer. He later pled guilty to two more murders and confessed to another murder, but with that last murder he was not convicted because it was part of a deal that he had made. He would confess and the charges would be dropped. The state really didn't have a good case on that last murder. They didn't have a body. In 2001, during an interview for an HBO special, he confessed to murdering a police officer and was convicted of that crime as well. But it really didn't make any difference in terms of how long he would spend in prison because he was already serving what was functionally a life sentence. It's really not clear if he actually committed this murder. Richard Kukunski died in March of 2006 while still in custody from cardiac arrest. Let's now take a look at the mental health and personality factors that could be at play in this case. I'll start with personality because this seems fairly clear. Using the five-factor model, it seems that Kukunski had mid-range openness to experience, low conscientiousness, we see a lot of evidence for this in his crimes, low extroversion, extremely low agreeableness, so he was highly antagonistic, and high neuroticism. Now, the neuroticism score might seem a bit surprising. Usually, we think of psychopathy as being associated with extremely low neuroticism, but that's factor one psychopathy, and we see that Kuklinski has a mix of both factor one and factor two psychopathic traits. So he was a bit emotionally reactive and impulsive, and therefore, again, we would think of him as having high neuroticism. I mentioned before that Kuklinski became popular because of these HBO specials. We see that in one of the specials, he claims to have killed over 100 victims. In his interview with Dr. Dietz, that number moved to over 200 victims. We see he tells all kinds of stories about using different methods of killing victims, like a crossbow, explosives, fire, rats, throwing somebody off of a building, poison, sharks. Some people he said that he randomly killed just to test his method. Other people aggravated him, and some owed him money. He also claimed to be a mafia hitman. This was never really established either, although he may have had some connection to certain mafia figures. As I understand it, all these claims were investigated, and no evidence has found that he committed any of these other murders. So we see in one of his interviews with Dr. Dietz, that clinician diagnoses Kukinski with antisocial personality disorder and paranoid personality disorder. So I'll give my thoughts on this diagnostic theory, this impression, as well as provide my own theory. Although it's worth noting that Dr. Dietz spent a lot of time with Kuklinski, and I'm sure he had a lot of information that he learned that wasn't revealed in the HBO specials, right? There's something different about being face-to-face -face with somebody. So even if everything that was recorded was made available, we see that Dr. Dietz still has an advantage in terms of assessing Kuklinski. Now, the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis. I'll just call this APD. This makes complete sense to me. That is a personality disorder associated with sociopathy, so factor two psychopathy. So you have somebody who's committing crimes, deceitful, impulsive, aggressive. They have a reckless disregard for the safety of others. They're consistently irresponsible and have a lack of remorse. So again, we see that it appears Kukinski has all of the symptoms required for APD. So we see factor one and factor two psychopathic traits. I think the problem for Kukinski is the degree to which he expressed all the symptoms. His tendency to commit crimes, his impulsivity, his aggression, his disregard for safety were so severe that he ended up committing several murders. It would be no surprise then to also think of his pathological lying as being extremely severe. We see that Kuklinski has told a number of stories about these other murders he supposedly committed, and when we hear the story for the second time, it becomes more unbelievable than the first time. He embellishes, and he adds even more 
fantasy to it. There's no way to know for sure, but if I had to guess, I would say that Kukinski got caught for just about every murder that he committed. I'm not convinced at all that he was a mafia hitman, and I'm not convinced he committed all these seemingly random murders because he was angry, aggravated, or he committed them simply for no reason at all. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. A more reasonable explanation would be that Kukinski was narcissistic. After he was sentenced to prison, he still had that need for attention and admiration, and people gave him attention. So he capitalized on that opportunity and made up all these stories. He used the actual murders that he did commit to bolster his credibility when talking about the murders that he likely made up. So this brings me to Dr. Dietz's second diagnosis, which again was paranoid personality disorder. I'll call this PPD. I think this is an interesting way to approach this case. It's not particularly common to see cluster B personality pathology and antisocial is in cluster B mixed with cluster A personality pathology where we see paranoid. But of course, it does happen. And it seems really hard to deny that Kukinski meets a few of the symptom criteria for that diagnosis. The disorder requires four of seven criteria to be met. So let's take a look at the symptom criteria compared to Kukinski's behavior. We start out with suspects others are exploiting, harming, or deceiving them, right? That's the first symptom criterion. So I would say here, maybe this is the case because of the circumstances he was in, but I'm not sure this was actually part of his personality. So I would say no with this first one. Next one, preoccupied with unjustified doubts about the loyalty of friends and associates. Now at first, this one seems very clear. He certainly had a distrust of his criminal associates, but he must have had a lot of people in his life, or at least some people in his life, that he didn't distrust. So again, it would appear that it was the context of his criminal activities where we would see this symptom occur. So again, I would say no. Moving to the third symptom, reluctant to confide in others, probably when he was actively committing crimes, although I think his narcissism got the best of him a few times, even there. He was convicted largely based on a confession to an undercover officer, as I mentioned. So overall here, I would say no. Now moving to the fourth one, reads hidden meaning or threatening meanings into benign remarks. I'm not sure about this one, but I think there is evidence that points toward this. So I would say yes. Number five, bears grudges. I think this one is fairly clear. He would meet this one. Moving to the sixth criterion, perceiving attacks and quick to react angrily. I think there's not much doubt with this one. This one seems like a yes. And then the last one, number seven, believes their spouse is cheating. I can picture this one being true, but I don't see any direct evidence to support this. He was horrible to his second wife, but it's not clear if he believed that she was cheating. So I'd have to say no for this last one. So he seems to meet three of the seven criteria, but one could certainly make an argument that it's likely that at least one of the other criteria was met. So there's a path for getting to this diagnosis. So it could be that Kukinski's paranoia combined with his psychopathy really made him an extremely dangerous person, a person that would lose trust or never develop it in the first place. And the extreme psychopathy would enable him to act on the paranoia. I think Dr. Dietz could have been correct with this diagnosis, but I've seen many arguments that people have put out there against the PPD diagnosis in this case. Let's look at a few of those arguments. The one I hear the most is the idea that paranoia occurred in the context of his criminal activity. And I factored this into my analysis when I was going through the PPD symptom criteria. Kukinski had the option of not committing crimes, but he chose to. He chose to expose himself to all that risk and to activate that paranoia. If he was really consumed by paranoia, why didn't he just stop? Or why did he start at all? So the idea here would have been that you really can't evaluate paranoia in the context where somebody should be paranoid. If someone is committing multiple felonies, including murder on a regular basis, they should be worried that someone's going to talk to the police. Somebody's going to find out what they're doing. That's a legitimate fear. Many criminals who have APD, antisocial personality disorder, and no other comorbid disorders do this on a regular basis. They suspect other people's motives. They worry that other people might be out to get them. It's a function of being a criminal. The next argument against the PPD diagnosis is Kukinski's appearance during those interviews that we see on HBO. 
Clearly, there was at least one camera in that room, and at least one microphone was there. He didn't seem paranoid there. He didn't seem to be afraid of Dr. Dietz. He answered all kinds of questions. Personality disorders don't change because of context. If he had paranoid personality disorder, he would be paranoid even during that prison interview. The paranoia would not simply go away because he believed he didn't have anything to lose. Symptoms of personality disorders are typically not conditional like that. Now, the last argument against the PPD diagnosis is the fact that Klukinski did kill for money, at least with some of the murders. It wasn't because he was criticized. It wasn't because he was afraid the person was going to turn him in. It wasn't because of a grudge. He wanted the money. Many of his crimes were committed simply to earn or steal money. So I think there are some legitimate arguments against the idea of PPD. It is a little hard to explain how he doesn't seem to have it in prison, but he had such a pronounced version outside of prison that it facilitated him in committing murder. It could simply be that the antisocial personality disorder pushed him toward criminality and the paranoia pushed him away, but the antisocial characteristics won out. So in a sense, through extending his antisocial behavior, he attempted to satisfy his paranoia. Now, if we move away from the paranoid personality disorder diagnosis, is there another way to conceptualize this case? It's hard to imagine without antisocial personality disorder, so I think that part would have to stay. But I think we could use the antisocial personality disorder and vulnerable narcissism to really get to the same place, maybe even in a way that's a little bit more consistent with this presentation. So again, the APT facilitated criminal behavior, but here we would see the vulnerable narcissism made him distrustful, hypersensitive to criticism, cold, distant, and defensive. All those characteristics of vulnerable narcissism we can see in his life as a killer and in the prison interviews. So in one sense, there's good evidence for PPD, but there's also good evidence for vulnerable narcissism. Even though narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, is mostly associated with grandiose narcissism, he technically meets enough of the criteria for a diagnosis of NPD, specifically a grandiose sense of self-importance, requiring excessive admiration, a sense of entitlement, a tendency to manipulate others, a lack of empathy, and arrogance. So six of the nine symptoms when only five would be required for the diagnosis. We also can't rule out the possibility that both were present at the same time with Richard Kukensky. He had both NPD and PPD, along with, of course, the antisocial personality disorder. Another important behavior that the vulnerable narcissism explains is the content of his lies. The lies he tells in prison about all these other murders point to narcissism. He wanted to be admired for being the most dangerous mafia hitman for having a quick temper, for being willing to kill somebody with almost no provocation, for being incredibly dangerous. Now, of course, for most people, they wouldn't consider these things something to brag about. But if we look at this through the lens of psychopathy, then all of these different things he brags about would seem like accomplishments from his perspective. So it comes down to this. He wanted to be feared. I find the Richard Kukinski case to be one of the most fascinating serial killer cases, not for all the stories he told about murders that he likely did not commit, but for the behavior that we know happened. We see somebody here with no toleration for criticism, impulse control problems, and a lot of aggression, whose personality was formed through heredity and the environment. And on both fronts, he had terrible contributions. All these factors came together to give him a particular combination of personality traits that made him extremely dangerous to people who knew him, when most serial killers would be more dangerous to strangers. So Richard Kukinski was quite a bit different than most serial killers. So I know whenever I talk about topics like serial killers, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate early interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.